the session on today, March 7th, 2022. We will start with a Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm going to go off script. Hopefully I don't get in too much trouble for this. Um, obviously, the things that are going on around the world right now um, lay heavily on uh, many of our hearts. And I was thinking that we could just have a moment of silence before we go. Thank you. Moving on, um, motion to approve. Oh, sorry. That is on the consent agenda, please, Diane. The A Board of Aldermen's meeting minutes. Any questions? All right, we'll leave that on the consent agenda. Next up, we have a presentation, a community survey with our Elon Police Department and presented by Gillian Kaplan. Hi, can everyone hear me okay? No. Nope. Oh. Okay. It's a moment. Just one second. Okay. She's going to turn up her volume. <laughs> Jillian. Jillian. Jillian, can you just test your audio one, audio one more time? Can everyone hear me okay? That's a little bit better. It's a, a little, little better. better. Still pretty low. Okay. Ours is up to 100. Um, I can speak really loudly. <laughs> um, hey. <laughs> or I can try to anyway. Um, can, can you hear me? Um, hold on one second. Can you, can you hear me now? There you go. Okay. Yeah, she can try again. Jillian, can you try again? Can you hear me? Any, any better? Um, no, we're, we're working on it. Okay. Is there a remote for this television, do you? It seems like there's some sound coming out of it. Same. It's the remote. It has, yeah, it's the same remote. You're saying the levels on the TVs are up? Mm -hmm. They're up as loud as they can go. What about in the room? Is there not room volume? Mm, yeah. We, um, everything is piped through this system here. And we used it on another computer recently, so I'm just making sure all the connections are still. Is the volume on your device turned up, Diane? I'll double check that as well. Sometimes those audio sources get messed up. Yeah, that's the computers too. Okay, try again. Okay, Jillian, can you try one more time? Can you hear me? Better, but not great. Yeah, we'll just go with it. We'll be extra okay. quiet in the room. <laughs> okay, um, and I don't know if I should try to share my screen. I don't know if that would just complicate things even more. Um, no, you can go ahead and share. Okay. Okay. 
Can everyone see that? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. And and I'm going to I'm going to try to speak as loudly as possible. I don't have a particularly loud voice, but I will I will project. Um, you know, in a perfect world, I would have been there in person. Um, I'm actually from Marietta, Georgia, so not super far away from you all, um, but live out in California. So this is kind of the best we could we could do given the current circumstances. Um, I wanted to note before I get started that as I was preparing for this today, I realized that the the presentation that we had put together, there had been some sort of glitch in some of the graphs that gave the wrong numbers, even though it was <laughs> right percent. Yeah, someone else noticed that. Okay, um, so I have sent uh, to the chief the new numbers, um, and I'm going. The numbers I'm going to be talking about today reflect the actual numbers in the presentation I'm, I'm showing, um, but the chief has the, the new presentation and my apologies for that. I have no idea how Excel and PowerPoint and PDF all just got wonky and put in 18 for every time there was a bigger number, uh, but I do apologize for that moving forward. So getting started, um, my name is Jillian Kaplan. I am a program manager at the National Criminal Justice Association. Um, I have been at NCJA for about a year and a half. Uh, prior to that, I was at the International Association of Chiefs of Police, uh, where I worked on a number of grants that were looking at how to heal communities and law enforcement in the wake of high profile incidents like officer involved shootings or violence against the police. Um, and a big component of that was obviously community police relationships and then office and then also officer wellness and how officer wellness impacted the relationship between communities and police. Um, through that project, the reason I'm giving you this background is because it's going to provide context to some of the of the pieces today. But through that project, I was working with um, a slew of cities from Minneapolis to Houston to Rapid City, South Dakota. Um, and I have quite a bit of experience working on um, relationships with communities. And so I wanted to put that out there because I think there's a lot to glean here um, from the relationship, from the answers to a lot of the survey questions about how the community feels about EPD and actually the really positive response uh, that was received. So wanted to just say that before we got started. Um, at NCJA, I work on our Burn JAG technical assistance grant through the Department of Justice that looks at how states can better um, allocate their Burn JAG spending. And through that, we do a lot of strategic planning. So the chief actually um, reached out to us to ask about what our, some of our strategic planning technical assistance was um, and how she could get involved in that for EPD as an agency and then also um, in relation to the town as a whole. So we started that process with a stakeholder survey and that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about some of the high level pieces of it. Obviously there's a larger presentation but there's things that I wanted to just point out and present on um, that I think are pretty high takeaways for this. So I'm gonna be moving pretty quickly through the survey. But essentially, uh, this survey was disseminated to the Elon community members between August 11th and September 28th and gleaned about 141 responses. About 56% of survey respondents were female, 41% were male, and 3% preferred, preferred not to answer. Um, there was a pretty broad range of ages. However, over 70% were over the age of 45. Um, and eight, about 85% identified as white or Caucasian and almost three quarters had a four year college degree or higher. So this was the demographic that was particularly answering these questions. I think that's important to keep in mind as we move forward. Um, another definite piece to keep in mind is that about 80% of respondents lived in Elon. Um, only 7% were business owners and only about a quarter uh, worked in Elon, but eight, about 80% actually lived in the town of Elon. When it came to interacting uh, with Elon PD, only 23% had received services from the, oh, excuse me. I'm so sorry, I'm doing this all at my by myself, so it's a little bit uh, 
couple different things I have to put together. But um, when asked about their interactions, only about 23% had received services from the department in the last 12 months, and less than 5% had been a victim of a crime that was reported to EPD within the, within the past 12 months. So when we're thinking about, again, who is answering this survey, it's going to be those that had more tangential or um, more passive interactions with the police department, not those that received services or were a victim of a crime. And we really, through this survey, the chief and I wanted to learn what Elon PD's relationship looked like um, with the broader community, as well as thoughts and feelings on the department throughout Elon. Um, honestly, overall sentiments were generally very positive. Like I said, I, I worked with quite a few departments um, throughout my time at IACP. And to see some of the results from this survey uh, was, was actually incredibly encouraging. Um, so about over half of respondents really feel that uh, EPD does a good job um, of developing relationships within the community. And 34% feel like they are trying but could do a better job. Um, and I wanted to highlight that piece about trying but could do a better job because I think there's some uh, reasons and some answers behind it that are, are talked about a little bit later. So just wanted to flag that now. Um, like I said in the beginning of this, there are a number of questions regarding the relationship, but in the interest of time, I do want to point to a few highlights. And I'm, I'm actually not going to move the slides because I, I would like to be able to speak to you and, and not have to, you know, not have to do 12 things at once. And I want you to, to be able to really hear these big takeaways. So 93% of respondents felt that EPD performs at an average or above average rate. And 95% felt that EPD displayed above average or average competency. So that's that's pretty huge. You know, I think one thing that's really important to note is it's obviously very important to understand that there is a group of people that do not feel that way. But when an overwhelming majority of respondents feel that they're doing an average or above average job, that's a, a very big deal. Um, most respondents felt that EPD regularly communicates with the community members at least a moderate amount, and only 13% found it difficult for community members to provide input. And about 90% felt that Elon PD at least somewhat develops relationships with community members. Um, these are pretty large percentage, percentage, excuse me, percentages. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm like yelling. And so I'm, I'm stumbling over my words a little bit more than I normally would. Um, but I think that it's really important to note that despite some of the feelings around um, capacity issues, which we're going to get into a little bit later, there is a lot of sentiment in the community that EPD does a very good job trying to at least be present and promote themselves within the community. So these are a couple of the, of the answers I just ran through. When asked about Elon PD's crime reduction efforts, more than 90% feel that EPD is doing at least an average job on crime prevention, community services, and traffic safety and enforcement. And I keep pointing to at least average or average or above average. And I know, you know, <laughs> in our in our American society, it's like, oh, well, we want to do above average. Average isn't, you know, average isn't good enough. But but thinking about some of the challenges that face law enforcement agencies in the country, um, an average job doing your job, um, given a lot of the struggles and, and, and the obstacles that are facing, I think is, is something really important to acknowledge. Um, so having you know, your community, more than 90% of your community feel that you are doing an average job or better on these areas, crime prevention, community services, traffic and safety and traffic safety and enforcement is really important. And arguably what's even more important is that 97% felt that EPD displays at least average attitudes, behaviors and professionalisms toward the EPD community. And this, when it comes to relationship building as I probably don't need to tell you all is the most important part. What do the attitudes, what do their behaviors look like? Do community members feel that they are professional? And to have 97% of your respondents believe that they do is, is, is very impressive. So these are just a couple of those 
pieces that I was just speaking on. As you can see, it's overwhelmingly positive. So when asked about safety, um, in general, an overwhelming majority of respondents felt that Elon was a safe place to live and that they felt safe and secure living and shopping in the town of Elon. I have been to Elon, you have a wonderful town and I can see why people would feel very safe living there and shopping there. Um, 90% of respondents felt that EPD did an average job of, or, or better of addressing concerns and promoting safety in their neighborhood. And only 3% felt that EPD did not help in providing a safe living environment. So again, this speaks to the idea that EPD is doing the job that they are put there to do and they're doing it in a, in a really effective way. Less than 10% felt that Elon PD did not understand the needs of citizens and less than 5% felt that EPD was not responsive to the concerns of community members. Over 90% of respondents felt that EPD was at least somewhat effective at both proactively preventing crime and addressing the problems that really concern them. So again, this speaks to a feeling of safety and security that is, um, that is felt because of the presence of EPD. So overall, 75% of respondents felt satisfied or very satisfied with Elon PD's overall performance and 88% trust the police department at least a moderate amount. So that community trust, which is, which is critical. However, I did wanna to point to one thing before I speak a little bit on an officer survey that we also, we also conducted um, and what some of the uh, results and recommendations that we gleaned from this work are. Um, I'm going to pull to that slide because I think this is really important. Respondents were asked to write in the top three areas that felt they felt that Elon PD needed the most improvement in. And the four biggest themes that I pulled from this were community engagement, follow-up, more officers and street patrol and more visibility. So these things were then coupled with an officer safety survey that we um, disseminated to the entire agency um, with responses from, from all, all, particip all um, agency staff where they talked about really valuing their job, being proud of the job they're doing, appreciating their job, enjoying their job, but then areas um, of concern were really around stress, around their health, both mental and physical, and their ability to do their job given a lack of capacity. So I think what's really important to gain here from these big themes when people asked, you know, where does Elon PD need improvement was all of those things, community engagement, follow up, more officers, more visibility have to do with capacity issues within the agency. Because if you're seeing these things as the themes, but then what you're hearing in general is that people are, are really satisfied with you know, officers from Elon Police Department, there is a lot of um, room to assume that the issue comes to actual officers being able to be on the street um, and, and capacity issues there. So I did wanna point to that as well. Um, and from there, I will, stop talking because I think those are really the high level pieces that I wanted to touch on today and um, give it back to you all. Hopefully you were able to hear me really try to yell. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a great yeller, but I did, I did try. Thanks Jillian. Um, luckily we got the audio to work a little ways into the presentation. So it was, oh, much so I was just, I was just yelling then at the end. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, any questions for Jillian while we have her? I have a, a question. I think there was a slide that I missed or we didn't go over the three issues that are greatest problems within the community. Did we cover that? I, I didn't like, cover that. I didn't cover that in this. No. Okay. Um, but we can, 10. Yes, we could talk were about those. That. Were those questions that people filled in the blanks themselves or were those questions that were they could pick you know, out of 10 or something like that? They could pick. They could pick. So, yeah. so they there was a list, and they could pick from them. 
Yeah, so the write-in questions were actually around the, the uh, where do you think Elon needs improvement? The agency needs improvement. Um, but this one was a, was a list. Jillian, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, first, uh, do you feel that this was statistically, um, the, the, the amount of, uh, of surveys was statistically viable for a community of 12,000? That's a great question. I mean, no, I don't think it's statistically significant if we're thinking about a community of 12,000 people. I do think it's important to consider the amount of, um, and I don't know those numbers, so forgive me if, if this is off, but amount of college students you have who may feel like this doesn't apply to them um, in, in this space. Um, but I would say that given the demographics of the people that responded, there's a pretty good swath there that I think is a good starting point. My second question is that it looks like in your demographics it was 3% or um, says black or African American. Yeah. And I noticed that in a couple of cases, even though I agree with, with the results, um, I sense that the small amounts I don't know, obviously, if, you know, if that was the demographic was reflected in those when they would disagree or say that there was not the sensitivity or those kinds of things, uh, if it was if it was representative of those folks. And again, that's probably hard to probably to read as well. Is that correct? So I didn't get into like um, more in detail than descriptive statistics, but if that is something you're interested in, we can work to pull that particular data out based on individual survey results. Given that I wanted to keep some anonymity to it and that it was only 3%, I didn't want to parse out by race. Um, but my assumption, and like maybe this is too much of an assumption, but my assumption would be that those that feel those sensitivity pieces or um, some, some sort of, you know, feelings of disgruntlement based on that are, are probably those people of color. Well, we don't know exactly for sure. That's, I mean, it just, it seemed like there was some, but I, pre, I appreciate your, your attempt at that answer. Cause I think that that's, that's still left a little bit open for us. And, uh, but I, I think there's other ways of approaching that and figuring that out. So, so thank you for what you've done with this though. Yep. And, and what I would say too, and this is something that Chief and I talked about, you know, this stakeholder survey, we do this um, at the state level a lot of the time with our state administering agencies of burn JAG funding. And um, one thing that we, tr we really try to stress is that this is kind of a starting point to see what areas you may want to work in, um, but that if you really want to understand a community, um, getting into things like focus groups, um, are a really great way of, of diving a little bit deeper into those details that you may want to parse out. Yeah. And we would be happy to help with that as well, just for the record. Any other questions? I have one quick one. Um, Julian, do you feel like there was, I, I know it, it's hard to to get these from numbers, but do you feel like part of it may just be that people just don't know for sure? Because there's there's some where it says, are they respectful to the public? And there's, gosh, I need new glasses, a large percentage that are just unsure. So is it just a matter of they don't know? Yeah, I would think it was that they didn't have a lot of interaction with the police. So even if, you know, we, we checked to see if they had been a victim of a crime or if they had received services from police department, but we didn't really dive into what the interaction looked like outside of that. So there could be people, because I think there were many questions, not many, but a, a good handful that said neither agree nor disagree or unsure. And I, I believe that those were probably respondents that really haven't had any interaction with law enforcement, so couldn't really say one, one way or the other. And that, frankly, it could, you know, could speak to a visibility issue and, and, and the fact that there seems to be some capacity issues as well. Thank you so much. I have any for that. It's good that you don't have an erection. Chief or assistant it, it chief. It is. Well, wait, I just wanted to say, I heard that. I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sorry, but it's true. And I, and I, I'm a pastor. And I, when the survey was out, I sent it out and made sure that the church knew about it. And several yeah. answered saying, I'm not sure I should be filling this out. I don't, I never, 
we don't usually see the police or, you know, this kind of thing. And, and uh, I said, well, still fill it out if you're able. So maybe that's part of what. That could definitely be part of it. I, I would say, it, yes, it's good that you're not having negative interactions with the police, but there is a lot of research and, and I can share things with the chief that maybe she can pass along as well. Um, around what positive interactions do to raise community safety uh, between law enforcement and, and the communities and actually what it does for morale on both sides as well. Um, so I think there's a lot to say about positive proactive interactions with law enforcement, whether that be through, you know, I mean, this is an extreme, well, not extreme, but athletic league or, you know, some sort of community event. A lot of times having positive interactions with the police does a lot, goes a long way to developing those community relationships outside of just calling the police when there's a crime or, you know, having a negative interaction with them. Just to wrap it up, you really feel like they this is a this is a really good report for our police department because you've seen a yes. lot of others. Oh yes, yes. I I I have seen. I mean, a lot, a lot of the departments that I've worked with um, have been in situations where you know they already had a contentious relationship with the community, but I would say like. This for, for us, we feel like the community really values the police department based again, based on a very small sample size, but I think it's a good starting point um, and really is a testament to a relationship that could grow in a very positive way compared to some other places. I don't think you're starting you know, at negative here. I think you're starting in a really positive place. Um, I, I think this was a good, a good study, I think. The big question would be is if this had been done in, uh, wasn't done in pandemic times, it would have been different because the associations, their law enforcement staff had been able to do was restricted. So yeah. the ability to, yeah. to interact with citizens who were on a police call, as an example, um, were limited. So the, the best exposure you could have hoped is somebody either was on one end of the spectrum, one who was stop for, yeah. for some concern or one who called somebody called the law enforcement for a concern and if you if you look at that population you probably have two different answers uh, so granted the, the, the survey number was 141 it's, statistically it's not representative but it does and it's and if you look at all the numbers and i agree with if it's average or above average that's a good that's a good day amen and i think 90 percent um i think we should commend our staff and our now, Chief, for taking initiative to do this and you know, think outside the box and not just think everything's, everything's fine. I think uh, that was a good, good use of our time. Yeah. And Julian, how often do most departments undergo a survey like this? Is this once every year, two years, five years, 10 years? I mean, ideally, you would do it once a year. Um, but I think typically it's in usually in a three year cycle as they start to think about, you know, their strategic plans moving forward as an agency. Um, the other thing I just wanted to, to mark based on, and, and I agree with you around pandemic timing, um, we're not just seeing low response rates, you know, in, in this agency survey, we're seeing it at state level surveys too, where, you know, three years ago, the response rate was, um, pushing 1800 and then you know this year it was like 100 and we think that a lot of that has to do with um fit pandemic fatigue and online fatigue and receiving a survey when you spend all your time on zoom and online you know it's you, you don't want to fill out another survey so i think there there's a lot to be said there i was just thinking about what you said you know we're in a pandemic people aren't seeing each other i think that also speaks to why people aren't filling things out in the same way that they would have before and just for reference this statistically significant with 95 percent confidence is 373 so it's still not a huge number that you need for that significant number um but and I mean, I know that the police department did all that they could to get, I mean, it was out there, it was pushed, it was promoted, but I mean, I'm the same way, you know, if I get invited to something on Zoom in the evening, I'm not joining, I'm not doing anything online in the evening unless I absolutely have to. So I get that for sure. Um, Chief or Assistant Chief, 
any thoughts on when you might want to engage in another survey? I mean, I know you just finished it, but you know, is this something that you would like to do annually every three years? Yeah, the, and I'll stand because I can talk better. The, the reason we, we did this is two prong. Number one, it was the start of our, our strategic plan. Uh, and we needed a baseline to see what, what the community actually wanted from us. We knew what we thought we knew, you know, we, we're good at what we think we're good at. Uh, and, and honestly, the community uh, engagement wasn't shocking because we haven't had the capacity to do that. Pre-COVID, we did some, you know, trading card things. It still is not a, it's not a COP culture. And that's what we're trying to build. So that, that wasn't shocking. Um, what I'd like for us to do or what I'd like to see us do is actually get a good handle on making some uh, achievable, measurable goals through the strategic planning and maybe go back and do a broader, larger scale uh, strategic plan later. One of the things that we talked about is doing focus groups as part of strategic planning. But again, I didn't want to keep, put, I put this off for three years because as soon as I took this position, the pandemic hit. And I didn't want to do online surveys, but at some point it's move forward or go backwards. So we just decided to, to do it. And if we have to crawl before we can walk, that, that's the goal. It gives us a baseline of somewhere to start and we can develop later as, you know, it'll become more complicated and, and more inclusive the later, um, further down the line we go, so. This was just kind of to get our feet wet and to, to also give everybody an idea of what we're doing, how we're doing, and, and what we need to move forward in. So, Were there any surprises in the data? I know you said that there weren't much in terms of you knew that you wanted to be more community oriented, but did you find anything surprising? Yes. I, I think it was very encouraging with the national, the national conversation and the national um push toward um, the, uh, I'll say the sentiment of law enforcement. I was bracing and preparing for some, some negative comments, some negative, a lot of negative feedback actually. Um, and I think it just attributes to what kind of great folks we have working here. And, and I tell them, focus on local. That's what we can change right here, right now. Because we, we've had folks that they get disheartened, you know, they get tired of watching the news and they get tired of hearing that we're bad. And the focus is to make sure everybody here knows we are not what's going on out there. That's what we can control. So I think when we got the survey results back, I think um, morale really came up. Um, you know, I, I, we've talked to, talked to the folks, our, our patrol staff, and, and I've tried to give them the sentiment of we're very proud of them for, for you know, what they have been able to accomplish this past couple of years. But yeah, I was... I was I was braced for impact, and I was really pleased that that we've actually had a pretty uh, pretty positive impact on our community here. So, I think if the numbers were higher, you'd still get those same results. Sure. Yeah. Well, thank you, Chief. I don't know if this is a, a time to do this or not, real quickly, but um, one I would say congratulations. I think those numbers are fantastic. Um, is there any one thing that points to what you really feel like you need as far as, you know, we had two things in here that stuck in my mm -hmm. mind, which one, people got most of their information through Facebook still, the folks that were involved in this, and two, the community engagement. And I know when we were looking at the budget, we were looking at that public information officer, and that seems to be like the perfect fit to the puzzle, part of the puzzle here. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the reasons, um, obviously, I had this information going into budget prep. Uh, but I felt like it was important for you all to hear it. We just got our, our officer wellness study back, um, that survey back, and uh, I wanted to include that, but it's too much in one, in one sitting. So um, again, having that capacity, it's great to have the PIO to be able to push it out on social media and to work as maybe a, a, a kind of a community engagement coordinator, but to actually have a couple people that can just focus on that and not the constant party calls and the traffic enforcement that, that actually have that ability to spend that time because building trust takes, it takes time and it's not going to happen in a day or a week or a, a few minutes on each foot patrol. It's something that has to be a conscious effort. Uh, and if we have a couple of people that are dedicated to that, then it, then it spreads and everybody becomes uh, kind of stewards of that culture. Being in a college town chief, um, and just looking at the, the numbers based on the stakeholders and the demographics, right? You had seven people that could potentially be a college student um, with that age. Is there any way, I'm, 
what is the average age of a call when you're called uh, to interact with somebody? And I'm sure that's tough to yes. written down somewhere, um, but you'd have to do all the paperwork to, to figure out that average. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, but, but, you know, so, so I'm just curious to see, because when we're, it goes to Monty's point, you know, with the interaction during COVID time would either have been you know, traffic stopped, you called the police or they were called on you, right? Um, and the people that did this survey are over half the town that's not doing the survey. So I was just curious if you had an idea of. Uh, I don't, it, it's hard to venture, I guess. I mean, we go to a lot of calls, not every, not every party call, as you guys know, not every party call gets a ticket. Not every right. party call has the kind of interaction I think most people think they have. Right. Um, I, I, we do, you know, we've looked at, uh, I try to keep up with stats on how, how many calls for service are we attributing to students mm -hmm. and, and primary residents? And it's about 20 to 25% student populated. Okay. Um, that's about as close as I can give you um, yeah, on, on that age demographic. Uh, and then of course, the rest of that 75% is, is a mixed bag. I didn't mean to put you on the spot, Chief. That's OK. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> Any other comments, questions before we let Jillian go? All right, moving on to public comments. This is the opportunity for anyone to speak about their concerns or wishes for the town. Each person will be given three minutes. If you would like to speak, please stand up. Make sure you signed in. Tell us your name and address. Anyone on the call? No. All right, we'll close the public comment section. Moving on to public hearings. Letter A, ordinance to make certain amendments to the Elon Code of Ordinances. And our planning director, Pam, will present this. Uh, very briefly, uh, mayor and board, and this is a collaborative e effort. So I'm gonna uh, ask, especially Kelly, to, 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 to voice uh, her part in this, especially to answer any questions that you may have. I believe it was just last month that we came to you with an LDO text amendment to address a uh, criminal reform statute and uh, warned you at that time that you'd be seeing this again in the form of amendments to our code of ordinances, uh, completely different set of ordinances that the town works with. And that's why we're uh, here this evening. Um, most of what was required here had to do with uh, the police department. Um, there was a little bit in our in our code enforcement that we took a look at and worked very closely with Joe. Uh, Joe Kalos here this evening hasn't been introduced yet, but uh, he worked with us to, to sort of wrap this up. And I'll also, uh, for full disclosure, let you know that because we don't like to come to you frequently with uh, amendments to our codes, we rolled in a couple of other things that have been sort of spinning around. And one very new thing that, that Diane uh, uh, wanted added, which had to do with uh, allowing flexibility in the board schedule, because as we determined, there is uh, language in the code that specifies what day um, of the month you'll do the meetings. So we made that change to just state uh, shall be held at a date and time established by the sitting board. Uh, so that was the first non uh, change change that was not required by statutes. Uh, the next one was we, we had um, just this is probably not going to happen very frequently, but we had an unfortunate um, situation at the cemetery regarding uh, a an upright headstone that was uh, sort of encroaching or at least very close to another grave site and the inscription on the stone was on the back side of the stone, not facing the grave of the person it was uh, recognizing. And after some discussion with uh, our folks, Diane and, and uh, Michelle, who work so closely with the cemetery, we decided let's just moving forward, have the inscriptions face the grave. Um, and very simple change, but that, that was something that we also added to this. And then another, just a correction, because we did a couple of years ago start uh, to handle our uh, yard waste and heavy, heavy bulk items in house. Our code was still saying that that was a contracted item. So it's just a little bit of housekeeping there. Um, 
Everything else here and uh, has to do with the uh, criminal reform statute that came down to us and we prepared um, a, a very brief summary of those amendments, which was included in your packet. And then uh, uh, mostly uh, Assistant Chief uh, Annabel and, uh, and, and Chief Blackwelder worked very hard to, to try to get the language for what they uh, needed in, in the actions that they take either uh, does it need to be criminal? If so, it needs to be specified in the ordinance that, it, that it's criminal. Uh, and so there, you'll see a lot of references in red to um, uh, cross-reference penalty C section 1.18, which is where our, our general penalty language is. Um, I'll also mention there is one other ch uh, change not related to the statutes that we made that, that, that I caught at the tail end of this. Uh, we changed our method of, um, I guess, assigning or selling uh, cemetery spaces and now our columbarium niches uh, from deeds to certificates. And that was at the recommendation of our attorney. And we still had one section in the cemetery chapter that had to do with a re required clause in deeds that we just struck. We just struck that language altogether and, and stated that it was repealed. So I'll back off of those items. If there are specific questions regarding the criminal reform statute changes that we made to the ordinances um, between uh, all of the folks that have um, <laughs> delivered blood, sweat, and tears over, the, over this, these changes, I think we could answer your questions. Any questions for Pam regarding this? I did have one question. I was curious about the headstone. Did they write on the backside as well? I mean, you say it didn't say what you can't, it has to be on the, the grave facing side, but if someone had inscription on both. Well, no, we didn't. Well, what we stated was that it shall have the marker inscription face the grave of the individual group being signified by the marker. So uh, perhaps it could have been more clear that it can only be on one side. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and happy to make that change before this goes to a vote next week, if you, if you think that's necessary. Are you making the current um, plot no. change? Okay. No, okay. That we, we, this would just be moving forward. Um, and just, I think a very rare situation, but because these things can be very sensitive, we wanted to avoid a future occurrence. And just, I just, just to be clear, other than the housekeeping things and the special things you talked about, most of this work was done to comply with the with the changes that we were required to make. Absolutely, and that was that was the the um, Senate Bill three hundred that came down from the General Assembly in uh, September. The only thing that um, stood out to me that I just had a question about was what it said, and I'm sorry I don't have it right in front of me. Um, it used to be a fine and or um, 20 days and now it's a fine and 20 days. Is that something that the state legislature was adamant about us doing? Or was that, I'm sorry, I don't have the reference point. No, you, I've, and, 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 and up to, right? Yes, uh, Shelby, so it was changed to, um, shall be subject to a fine of $50 and imprisonment up to 20 days. Rather than, rather than or. So I think, would I be interpreting this correctly, Joe, that this is saying it's still not a requirement. The imprisonment up to 20 days is not a requirement. It's that, you're, that you would be subject to both. You would be subject to both. both yeah. Potentially. That there's both a financial and a, and a, and a deterrent. Is that most recent 14-4? Because I thought it was stricken from that, actually. There's the one I got off the general assembly. I can look. Well, he was put, he was pulling up the statutes while we were wrapping this up. And they stuck to more recent than the penalty for fifteen. Yeah. Let me get this to come up. Uh, I was looking at section. I mean, I was looking at this, but it shows up several in several places. Okay. Yeah, it shows up in chapter 13 and okay. several others. It's a, yeah, it says 
guilty of a class three misdemeanor and shall be fined. And the statutory history at the bottom uh, refer references 2021. We can certainly double check that if you want to, but I think it's both. We, we can check though. So we're going from an or to an and. That's all I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. So it's it's an additional time is now added as opposed to it just being uh, or. <laughs> So it's time plus, it, it would be time plus, plus imprisonment plus a civil penalty, a, a fine. Is that in multiple locations? In the it, it, it is. Okay. It is. Section seven. Right. Control. And just. For the record, that's the we don't we determine the imprisonment time. It would be a judge. Oh no! And here we go. What she's saying, and I think we can we can fix this in the one point uh, is we just need to delete imprisonment of up to uh, up to twenty days, right? Yeah, and these also you've got the B one and B two. They're not really included. It's a little different. It doesn't even specify the new. We we can take a look at that language yeah. and clarify. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I just had I just was confused about the improvement we need part. To leave the that. public hearing open till next week. Yes. Yes. Leave it open. Okay. And then if there are any changes, we can bring it back to you at that time and um, before you make a vote. Thank you. Okay. And you have that, Diane. Yes. Yeah. Any other comments, questions regarding letter A? All right. Again, we will leave that public or public hearing open. Next public hearing to consider LDO text amendment number 22-03 regarding conditional planning district. Thank you. And I'm going to present from the podium, if I may. And we're going to turn one of these screens so that you can see it better your stick it's on this side in front of rich and it's better for this monitor that you see that you view this monitor that's cool the two were there <laughs> it was really so high tech yes yeah <laughs> all right there we go <laughs> how's that look <laughs> thank you so now give me a moment to share my screen. And I, I do have a presentation on this item. And uh, we have some folks in the audience that will also want to speak to it, including our applicant, Mr. Chad Huffine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank All right. So this presentation is, is almost word for word what you had in your packet, but we want to go through it um, to see if questions come up that we can answer for you along the way. Um, we did receive a petition from Mr. Huffine for consideration of an LDO text amendment that would allow conditional zoning as an alternative choice to the conventional zoning uh, that we now do, and I'll uh, talk a little bit about the terminology in just a moment. I do want to let you know that uh, as we were been working on the LMO, this was one of the things on our list to make sure it was included. Um, it's a fairly common practice now in, um, in local governments to allow this as a secondary option for, uh, for rezoning cases and uh, we felt that we were overdue for it here. Um, however, uh, that timeline, as, as you know, has been, has been delayed and Mr. Huffman uh, was interested in moving more quickly. Um, and I'll also mention that uh, Mr. Huffman did submit the, the draft language and uh, I took a uh, red pen to it and basically made it into the language that we would have included in the LMO and sent it back to him and said, do you, do you uh, have any disagreements? Is there anything we need to negotiate here? And he accepted every change that I made. So this would have been what you would have seen with, uh, with the LMO coming to you for adoption in the future. Um, 
I don't know that I need to read all of this uh, word for word. This was all in your packet. What we've done is try to um, bring in some, some outside, um, I guess, de data on this, uh, this provision. Generally, um, when you have a property that someone wants to rezone, uh, it's uh, going from one district to another and everything that goes along with that district uh, comes into play. Uh, this is a quote from a uh, bulletin produced by the School of Government that uh, just describes what conditional zoning is. And there's a lot of terminology that can be confusing. Uh, conditional use permits is one, something that we have not had here for quite some time and is now not uh, allowed by statute. As a matter of fact, the statutes, when they adopted 160D, one of the things they wanted to do was try to um, eliminate some of the confusion and all of these similarly sounding uh, terms. And so conditionals, uh, conditional use permits are not, um, are not even allowed anymore. But uh, what they're saying at the School of Government is that conventional zoning, which is what we have now, uh, changes zoning district, district that's applicable to a piece of property, but do not include any standards beyond those base standards of the zoning ordinance. Conditional zoning, which is the option that's being presented tonight through this text amendment, allows the local government and the applicant to agree on additional conditions that may be appropriate for a particular project within the context of legislative zoning. And just uh, with regards to the terminology, uh, there's a zoning map amendments, uh, also district reclassifications, which is actually what it says on our application form, which I think will change. Uh, I'm gonna re just refer to those as rezonings. Uh, conventional zoning, which is what we do now, uh, can be referred to as general use district zoning. And that's how I'm gonna refer to it because conventional sounds too much like conditional and it gets confusing. Um, and that, that is the type of zoning that we do now if somebody were to come here and say, we want to, to move from the SR district to the NR district, for, for example. So our LDO currently only allows that uh, general use district zoning. Um, however, this conditional option has been uh, pretty popular since the General Assembly allowed it as an option in 2005. And I won't go through these statistics, but uh, the School of Government did do a survey in 2018 just to see how it was, um, how well it was, it was accepted, uh, how, how much was it used, um, and of course the larger communities tend to use it more. This really before the General Assembly um, included it as an option in the statutes, Charlotte was using it and um, sort of, I guess, being groundbreakers in the way that they were using it and uh, some, there, there was a need, uh, I think, for some clarity and standardization of it. And that's why it went to the General Assembly and said, well, if it's a good option, let's just make it the same for all the communities across the board. But it is a pretty popular option and particularly in the larger cities. Um, no different from, from the rezoning that we do now, it's only for a particular property. Um, in this case, However, you can add conditions that would tailor the proposal to the, to the property that's um, subject to the rezoning. And there are several benefits associated with this, with this option. And I'm gonna do this quickly, um, but happy to take any questions uh, while we're going through this or afterwards. And that, that is that some land uses are just uh, not appropriate uh, for, for, certain prop, for certain properties due to their impacts to the surrounding area. Um, and they cannot always be predetermined or controlled by the general use district standards. Also that when a property is rezoned to a general use district, all of those allowable uses that uh, are on that, are allowed in that district are at the applicant's uh, disposal. So when you pull up the commercial uh, planning district in our LDO, everything that's on that list when you say, okay, we're gonna allow you to rezone to, to commercial, that means you can do any of these. Um, they may not wanna do all of those. May, they may have a specific project in mind that only needs one or two of those uses. And some of the uses might be more appropriate for the, for the site than others. Um, 
also want to say that uh, the conditional uh, approval can limit the number of uses that the applicant comes to you with. They may uh, have, uh, only, as I mentioned, only one or two uses out of that list that they're interested in. And uh, you have the assurance of not wondering which one of the other 20 uses they might ultimately put on the property. Uh, this one is an important one, and this has to do with uh, plans that sort of describe what the what the project might look like. We haven't done rezoning in a long time, but generally when you get a rezoning request, you're just asked to, to, to say, is it appropriate to move it from this district to that district? You're not really seeing anything about the project yet because that comes later. Uh, and it does leave a lot of uh, questions on the table. So once you've rezoned the property, then they might come back with a uh, major development plan process, which is what we have in our, in our ordinance now. And that's when you start to see more of the schematic plans and the engineering gets involved and you get a better sense of what they're actually trying to do there, but you've already rezoned the property. With conditional zoning, a site plan would be required as part of that uh, application. And if uh, you approve it and the site plan changes or some significant part of the programming of the project changes, they have to come back to you for uh, approval of whatever those changes are. Um, I think the negotiation, negotiation um, option for this is, is perhaps the most important. Um, I did work with uh, conditional districts in, uh, in, in, in Aberdeen when I was there for eight years. It was used, it was pretty popular, uh, used for a, a wide range of, of, of things, including something just as simple as we had a, um, a uh, beer manufacturer there that just wanted to be able to ha have a tasting bar for their folks to, uh, if they came in to be able to, to taste the beers. And that fell into the category of um, restaurants and bars, but they were in an industrial district because they were manufacturing. Um, so all they wanted to do was add that one additional use, which was not allowed in, in the industrial district. And that was the only change that we made. Uh, we added, uh, you know, tasting of alcohol, or that's not exactly how it was worded, to the list of allowable uses for that property only. And I'm not saying that every, every proposal, proposal you'll get will be that simple. Some of them will be much more complicated, but it does allow you to uh, negotiate with the applicant over, um, this is an example, if you know, perhaps you can have higher density in the center of your project than would otherwise be allowed if you create deeper buffers along the perimeter or if you add more open space. And then there is an important um, point that, to be made here, which I think we all know by now that we've been restricted by the General Assembly from uh, imposing any architectural standards on single family and two family dwellings. Um, this may not even be a need, uh, but if it is a need, this is one avenue that you have to be able to impose those standards. Uh, this is the only avenue that you have uh, by statute to be able to say we, we, we want to have greater architectural standards on those types of, of dwellings than what you're proposing. And then you negotiate how you get those with, with, with the applicant. You get something, they get something. And the idea is that you get a better project at the end. Uh, and then I think this might be the last one, but it's an important one is that um, what I've worked with before and what we have in this proposal is that a community meeting would be required before the item goes to the planning board. And it would be held by the applicant, but they would produce a report that would be given to the planning director uh, that would describe what was discussed at the meeting, how did they notice it, uh, who did they notice it to, and they would at least have to notice it to the same uh, adjoining property owners that we would have to um, when it comes to public hearing. And um, what outcome, did you make any changes based on what you heard at the meeting? And that would be available for you to um, decision is one more step allowing more public input into into the process um 
these are uh, one of the things that we require for rezoning applications is uh, an, a narrative uh, from the applicant. And I'm going to, I'm not going to read these or go through them. These are really um, the questions are from our application. The answers are from Mr. Huffine and uh, certainly uh, what, what the intent here is there are certain questions that you have to be comfortable with in order to make your decision. Some of those have to, have to do with uh, why, is the, why is the change needed? How is it in the, in the best interest of, of the public in general? Um, and that's what these questions are intended to, to answer and uh, to help you make that decision. So I'll allow him to you know, address you here in just a moment. And these questions may come up and he may want to elaborate on the answers. procedural issues. This is, I will say that the planning board met last month on this. And uh, after, I think, a very thorough discussion and understanding of the, of the proposal, uh, they made a unanimous um, recommendation for approval. Uh, lastly, there is a land use plan consistency statement requirement uh, from, the, from uh, the, uh, the statutes. And generally what we do is staff will prepare a recommended statement, we'll provide it to the planning board. Uh, they may change it, uh, they may strike it and do a whole new one. But in this case, they, they took exactly what we had recommended. And the idea is that you wanna always go back to your land use plan for guidance whenever you're making decisions like this. So we look through the land use plan to see if there are items in there that would either support or not support the proposal. Sometimes it's not easy to do, um, but in this case, we, we found two or three that we, we thought, thought were relevant and we are incorporating those into the, to the statement that um, you'll be asked to vote on next week. Um, and lastly, uh, this would be also a part of the statement that just ba basically, uh, summarizes what we found in, in the plan and how that uh, supports a decision that this proposal is reasonable in the pub and, and in the public interest. It has to do with, with flexibility and tailoring the development process um, for getting better projects. And with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, Chad Huffine is here tonight and uh, representatives from uh, Greenhawk company from Raleigh. Um, I don't think that, um, that, that, that it should be any secret that this is a precursor to an actual project that will be coming to you. Uh, and yet that is in the very early stages. There have been no, um, uh, no applications, no submittals. Um, uh, really, this is the first step in sort of um, getting this project going is allowing for them to bring to you a um, conditional zoning request where you would see then uh, more of what, what the project entails. I had one quick question. Yes, sir. It wasn't, because I was able to be at the planning. So I- That's right. I really got through all of this mm -hmm. in some good ways, but um, so the beer place gets their permission for that conditional use permit, then they go out of business and some other business goes in. Do you renegotiate these conditional these conditions to the new owner? Is this, in other words, is this all based on a particular owner or a particular group that has own, owns own? Great question. Generally, rezonings run with the land, and so it would still be available to a new owner there unless they came back to you with another a different type of request for a different use, which might be another conditional zoning. And at that time, be, we, we could change whatever conditions. That's exactly right. Or it might just be um, an, another general use district zoning where they're saying, we don't want to be industrial anymore. We're, we're not going to make beer anymore. We just want to be a restaurant and a bar. Can we zone to the commercial district or whatever district allows that use? Okay. But it runs with the land. One question I had, is there a time limit? Obviously, if it were granted, is there a certain period of time or expectations where that would have to be completed? Um, actually, there is, Monty. 
and leave it to you to, 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 to ask the question that requires me to dig into this. But there is, uh, there is some really protection built into this. Let me see if I can find it. That gives them a time limit to begin a considerable portion of the work. No sooner than two years after the date of approval of petition, the LDO administrator, which would be your planning director, may examine the progress made toward developing the property in accordance with the approved petition and any conditions that were attached. And if they determine that the construction has not commenced or that substantial progress has not been made, they shall forward it to the Board of Aldermen, a, a report which will recommend that the property be resigned to its previous zoning classification or to another planning district. Um, it would go before the planning board before it came to you and they would give you a recommendation uh, regarding that. There's also the option that an extension of an additional 12 months might be granted for them to make that substantial progress. So this, you know, this constitutes, when you look at the actual draft am amendment, uh, it's all red because this is all new language to us. Um, and basically what you would see when, in, when one of these comes to you is that you'll see something in the form of, because we call, at least right now, <laughs> uh, the LMO will probably handle this differently, but we call our zoning districts planning districts. You might see instead of um, the village center, planning district, it, it might come to you as the village center conditional planning district. And it would apply only to that property. It would have the list of conditions that are agreed on uh, both by you and the applicant. And that's another requirement. You can't just do it without their, you, know, you can't say, well, we're gonna add this condition. And they say, we really can't go that far and you approve it anyway. It has to be mutually agreed upon. Um, so I think that the, the, the monikers will be familiar to you. It will just be a, an especially tailored uh, rezoning petition for a particular property. Is there any reason why we haven't done this before? <laughs> well, that's a great question. It's been on my to-do list for you know, three, three and a half years, but there's just so much else that was also needed. And unfortunately, the the progression or lack of it with the, with the LMO, it, it, it would have been included in that and we expected to have that adopted by now. Um, and so I think it's it's really not surprising to me that someone has come forward with a request to do it. Uh, Mr. Huffman, uh, you know, presented the application, paid the fee for it, knowing that it was something that was was sort of in the works, but just not on a timeline that, that worked for him. I, I think that you will see quite a few of these come. I think that it will be um, very important that uh, that they be um, looked at very thoroughly, and that the conditions um, that both you are getting what you think you need, and that the applicant is getting what they think they need to the greatest degree possible, and still have a project. My experience with this is that that it does help you get better projects, especially if you're not looking for cookie cutter development in your town, uh, because you can negotiate so many of the fine points and get something that would be uni unique to that site that you wouldn't see in a neighboring community. So my question about the timeline, because obviously we experienced some of that with, I guess it was the, the development, they got transferred hands multiple times. So those conditions would transfer to the, to the new owner as well, right? Yes. In, in the timeline. And the reason yes. I ask that question, because obviously if one of these stipulations were well, as a concession, if you build a greenway or, or bike paths or something like that, and if you start a, a major development and you get halfway through that, um, it's not like you can go back and rezone it to what it was originally. You've made those concessions as a town to, 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 to encourage that project, which we, we all would want to happen. But if something happened, 
where they couldn't complete that part of it. Mm -hmm. What happens? What what options does, does the town have? As far as I mean, is this specific to something like a greenway that might be included? Yeah, it could be in either. One of the concessions, maybe it's a berm or something yeah. that has to be completed uh, for the end of the project. Yeah, it's it's a good question. I'm not sure. You know, my experience has been, you know, some of the best controls that you have on timeline have to do with things like. Uh, you know, the final coat of asphalt going on the roads. Um, generally, when it's, a, when, it, when it's a residential subdivision, you're not, allowing, um, cert, you're not allowing lot development to take place until certain things are done. And we do have performance guarantee language in the, in the ordinance uh, that protect us there. Um, it's unfortunate. And I think that a lot of communities have experienced uh, projects that just sort of die on the vine. And in, the, in this case, it was particularly unfortunate because the property had been altered dramatically. Yeah. Um, the economy has so much to do with, with, that, with that happening. Uh, and I've seen it elsewhere. In this case, it wasn't so much the economy. It was just maybe a, a bad business decision. Um, I will say that, that in, in just for full disclosure with the timeline, the, the applicant can also um, declare vested rights right up front that gives them a little better protection that they can finish a project that they start. But as far as um, protecting the town from a project that starts and, and developer goes belly up and you know, can't complete it, I, th I, th I think that um, there, we, we just don't have full protection from that. Um, one comment, one question. So I was also part of that with Randy and the planning board was as thorough as they could possibly be. And Mr. Huffine was uh, very thorough in his presentation as well. Um, the only question that I had was just one of the, or more common is one thing that you did bring up that sort of stuck in my head when you were talking to them was that as a board, we're going to have to do a lot more work or the planning board, we're going to be need to be more thorough. And if I'm misspeaking, just let me know. And we need to negotiate more strongly. Am, am I getting that right? Truly, the work is going gonna, is gonna to be mostly between your developer and your planning staff. Yeah. And that's not to say that, that, that whatever we present you, you're going to take lock, stock, and barrel. You know, you, you, you should, uh, you know, question, add. You, know, you may have specific things that you'd like to see uh, uh, included, and that's part of the the process. These things don't don't often get approved in the in the first in, 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 during the first meeting. I mean, sometimes they do. If they're pretty straightforward, they do. But um, you know, I do think it. I think it probably is more more work for staff. But um, I just find the the options without this to be well. I'll put, we had some of this conversation at the planning board. Our ordinance right now is pretty restrictive and someone, someone looking at a piece of property and saying, but I'd like to do this with it. And I think it's a good project. How can I make that work? And they, they're trying to, 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 to force a square peg and a round hole with our, with our ordinance. Our ordinance was adopted in 2004. It was ahead of its time for the time, I think. Um, but is long overdue for an update. So I think it's going to be important that um, you have staff that knows how to work, navigate this and work through it and that they can, you know, my, my objective has always been to try to bring something to you that you can say yes to. And that's not because, um, you know, I, 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 I want to, you know, shove anything down your throat, but because I don't want to put you in a position of, of not, feeling certain, um, and, and yet you may still not agree, agree with me, but it will, it will be important that, that somebody work through those negotiation um, points carefully. If you have good developers who've done this in other communities, they, you know, they often know, um, you know the best way to, to navigate that as well and, and help their elected officials be comfortable with the decision that they're making. Thank you. And I know you worked really hard on this as well. I just had a quick question. And if you don't know it, I don't want to put you on the spot. We did bring up um, whether you knew whether Gibsonville had a conditional use zoning or not. And if you don't know it offhand, don't worry about it. 
it was just in I, I did, I, that. Yes, and I did forget to look 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 that up, but I'll bring it to you next week. No, no problem at all. Thank you very I much. Don't, I don't know. You've had a lot on your plate. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to say that I think that if they did have it, we might be seeing some more create more creative um, developments coming out of Gibsonville more so than what we're seeing. Any other questions for me and, Ch and Chad? I'd like to turn it over to you for anything you want to add or address the board. Okay, Mayor Council, it's good to see you tonight. My name is Chad Huffine, I'm a civil engineer in Burlington, 505 East Davis Street. Um, Jeremy Medlin's here with me tonight. Tony Tate's here with me tonight. We're when you add up all of our years of experience and throw Joe in the mix for 120 years, I'm just kind of doing the math in my head of <laughs> land development, landscape architecture, civil and law. So tonight is a good night for you to seek out our motivation and then for us to give you feedback on what you're about to undertake. If I'm the council or if I'm the alderman, the first thing I ask is, well, what's this guy's motivation? Why is he here tonight? Um, the first project I presented in Elon was in 2001. And at that time, we had a, a small piece of property with 117 townhomes, and they're all the same. And they all sold like hotcakes, and it's been wonderful. Um, in the later 2010s to 15s, we've brought some projects to the town, which we could have, couldn't accommodate. Um, we've looked uh, for this particular project at the, the language and the ordinances that we have now. And the projects are of a scale or of a stratification of different uses that the town's ordinance just simply does not have the framework to accommodate a good quality project um, for us to use or to go by. There are portions of the ordinance that work and they're maybe too small. There are percentages of uses that mix in the current ordinance that don't work with reality right now. And when Pam says some things are due uh, for a change, it's, it's true. There are a lot of uh, municipalities um, in your area that uh, wrestle with conditional zoning. And it is a benefit to you as a town decision-making board and as a benefit to Jeremy as a land developer to work through issues early on in a project's conception flesh out some of the difficulties that you've seen with other projects or that Jeremy may have faced with other projects or that we've seen as professional designers with other projects and get those out early and then give each other some assurances. Okay, this is what we are uh, bringing to you as a decision maker and this is what we're planning to build. And with conditional zoning, it is site specific to the plan that we present to you in addition to the text or the conditions that go with that plan. So when you leave with an approval or a denial, you know exactly what you were approving and denying. And so our motivation for being here is to run, run full back for Pam because she just does not have the time to dedicate to something that's been on the list to do since we've met. Um, so we, we fortunately had a, a developer that had interest in Elon who hired us to bring this to you. And um, it's a good thing for you. It's a good thing for future development. Um, it is a responsibility that's going to add to your workload. It adds to our workloads as well. But because of that, the quality of the projects that you get, um, like Pam said earlier, um, Elon's going to be better for that. So um, I'll pause for a minute because the motivation piece for me is what's missing. And now that you know what, what we're here for, um, I think I'll let Jeremy speak to the project and then Tony can speak to the uh, ordinance language a little bit and then I would think that while you have us here you should ask as many questions as your watch will allow and uh, just get comfortable with what you're you're about to take on. I do have one question um, and maybe Joe are we allowed to talk about the project even though it hasn't been before the planning board? This is not specific to the project this is specific to the just, text amendment. Okay. This is a completely separate pre pre preceding item. Okay. So thank you. I was on the LMO committee. Um, I haven't participated quite as much since becoming the mayor, um, but I do know that this was part of the plan and Monty is on that um, committee as well. And um, with our previous consultant, he really did discuss the benefits of kind of, you know, 
changing up the way that our ordinances are written to accommodate development. So I just wanted to share that with everyone. And I'll add to that, that it, it's actually in one of the chapter drafts, but not, not, I don't believe that was ever presented to the LMO. I don't believe we got to that point and I had not had a chance to review it. So what you're seeing uh, in, this, uh, in this amendment uh, would be what I would have drafted if, um, or what I would have changed that draft to uh, once it had gone through that, pro through that process. And I don't know, could I just say one thing about it, if, if that's okay? Yeah. Um, I, I think conditional zoning is a really good thing, generally speaking. Um, I would only give one small cautionary tale <laughs> about it. And when I was involved with the city of Burlington in redoing their ordinances, uh, you know, I think they had the same consultant that you had originally yes. engaged to do yours, but one observation that was made is, is throughout North Carolina, conditional zoning is used to kind of up the game, you know, for what you're doing out there. Unfortunately, in some instances, the city of Burlington kind of downgraded the game. I think the example that was given was the Western Loop Overlay District for University Drive, that there were some more rigorous standards that were there, but conditional zoning may have been used to override that and maybe put some stuff that wasn't there. So. It's an amazing tool, but as long as it's used to kind of up what you're doing, not to go down. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, and I was going to mention that that was that that's really the only um, uh, cautionary tale that that I've heard is that you do need to be careful to not use it only to relax your standards. That, that there should be um, a negotiation between getting something and giving something. You said that at the planning meeting several times. Yes. Comments, questions? Yeah, if I may sit down and let Jeremy spill in. Okay, I'm, I'm Jeremy Medlin. I'm with Green Hawk Corporation. We're based out of Raleigh. Um, as Pam put it, uh, and I, and I guess I'll use the same analogy that I, that I use with the planning board. Basically, the conditional use zoning is like a shared toolbox. So you think about it this way. Uh, we've got a toolbox that we're pulling tools from, you are, I am, and we're creating and building something special and unique. And I think that's what we're gonna be doing here in Elon, hopefully with your support. Um, I work in a lot of different municipalities and it's, it's, a, it's a pretty common practice. And I think you get more thoughtful, well-designed des, uh, and more interesting products and uh, projects uh, with the conditional use zoning. And uh, you've got a great town the way it is. Uh, but to, uh, to Pam's point, when looking at some of these properties that are, are begging to be mixed use, there's just no way to to make them mixed use. There's no way to transition and there's no way for them to evolve and transition in the logical layers that they need to without coming up with something like a conditional use zone. Um, anyway, we're very hopeful for your support. We will be bringing something in. If we do have your support, we will be bringing something in very, very quickly. Um, and I'll, if you have any questions, just let me know. Um, one of the things that you all brought up was the fact that, well, first of all, thank you, because I think all of us want to see progressive growth in our town done in a, in a strategic way, done with the help, with the community involvement. The only question I have, and I, I feel bad asking this because I don't want to put you all on the spot. Did I say that twice tonight? Um, the reason why I'm asking is, is I live in the Ashley Woods neighborhood. And the reason why I asked Pam specifically about what was going on in Gibsonville is because there was a developer there that has come in and there hasn't been a lot of uh, community involvement. And what has been left are a bunch of stumps, um, which was supposed to be a development. And again, you don't have all the information in front of you to, to answer this question. But I guess the thing that I'm trying to get to is the community didn't feel like they had a lot of input on what happened there and they're not happy with the development that has gone in there. And so it's buffered right up against my neighborhood. And if I didn't ask this, my neighbors would probably be upset with me. What sort of input does this give a community is my basic question. Does it give more? Does it give less? Does it give the same? 
I'll, I'll go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. And, and correct me if I if I misspeak or miss uh, miss uh, miss speak on this, but community involvement that we're talking about would be you know we'd have a neighborhood meeting coming out of the gate, and I think the mailer the mailer radius would be 500 feet around the site around the property, and uh, so. Uh, coming out of the gate, we would be engaged in meeting with the community. They'd have my information and Tony and Chad's. Uh, so you are looking at the at the design team here. Um, so we'd hit that head on. And then um, we logically, we'd be working with them through the process, through planning board, public hearing, and then uh, a vote of support, hopefully from you folks. They were right on the line of Gibsonville and Elon. So if it goes over the line, is that why we never, that neighborhood never heard anything? Yes. Well, so well no, no, I, I take that back. If, if there was a public hearing, you should have been noticed. If you're an adjoining property owner, you should have been noticed to go to the public hearing in Gibsonville, no, regardless of where you, right. what jurisdiction you were in. Okay. But as we can see, public hearings don't fill rooms. Well, but the thing is, there are opportunities there. It's not like we're in a back office making decisions. The public has an opportunity to be pre present at the planning board, as well as our meetings, to voice their opinion, uh, and to bring information that could, can make, help us make a decision one way or the other. So I, I think it's I think it, it is transparent. It's a it's a process that allows people to have um, opportunity to speak up or speak against something. Probably in this case, uh, conditional use zoning would be much more transparent than regular zoning. And that's what I was trying to understand, Jeremy. I think the mm -hmm. fact that you have more input on what's going on back and forth rather than just a set agreement from day one going forward, there's a there's a back and forth, a give and take with this. And uh, the the amount of detail and level of sophistication you're going to see through the process, I mean, you're probably talking eight to 10 plan sheets. And so you're going to have nice visuals on what you are receiving versus uh, the unknown. Right. And you know that'll cover a lot of the details and, and hopefully uh, resolve a lot of the apprehension that comes with a new development coming in somebody's backyard. Thank you very much. This certainly does add uh, that extra requirement of the community meeting before the planning board, before, before the public hearing that we don't see with other types of pro proposals. Um, and that was uh, a requirement with the conditional zoning uh, ordinance that I'd worked with before. And it was, it was actually part of, of Chad's, Chad's you know, text as well. And so I wanted to make sure that it was in there, but it already was. Any other questions? Thank you, Pam. Thanks to all of you. Really appreciate it. And hopefully we'll get some exciting things here before us here soon. Thank you all for coming and kind of spurring this on and uh, put together a lot of good work. It still is a public hearing. Do have we ask for public comment? Oh, thank you. Rachel. That's an excellent reminder. <laughs> Are there any public comments? All right, we will close that public hearing. Okay, do we, do we need a restroom break? <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah, you all are welcome to leave or you're welcome to stay. So I know that you have a drive. I have a question for you. Okay. Procedurally, you'll vote on this next, next meeting. 15. 15th and do you recommend that one of us be in attendance at that meeting or I do not think that that's necessary closed? unless you just really want to be here which you're simply welcome well again we're grateful for a short drive so it won't be so bad for you if you want to <laughs> <laughs> baby street's not that far not that far at all and we're also on zoom yeah, that's yeah you're welcome to join on zoom if you prefer to join on zoom but, you know. Necessary unless you just wish to. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. New business Board of Aldermen meeting schedule. Diane? Well, um, what happened in the board retreat 
was discussion was made about um, having a work session and regular meeting, changing the time from um, the first Monday and second Tuesday to the second Tuesday and fourth Monday. But the question on the floor is, was it gonna be the regular meeting on the second Tuesday and the work session on the fourth Monday or vice versa? My thought was we were gonna maintain the Tuesday as our regular meeting. Yeah. And we would make the agenda, it's all how you wanna look at it, is before the meeting after meeting. Well, it's before the next meeting. So eventually we'll look at it as like in the end of, in April. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll look at that fourth Monday is the prelude to the May meeting. May. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was okay. what I have found just the last two months. I've had meetings scheduled on the second Tuesday mm -hmm. that I had responsibility to go to. And it got bumped because that Monday, which was an agenda meeting, bumped our, our official meeting. Mm -hmm. so right. I think this will help alleviate 99% of the time. Yeah. Where that became a problem. Um, does that pose an issue with the April regular meeting, though, because we don't have an end of March agenda session. Yeah, it, yeah, it would. I mean, not necessarily significantly. If you trust us to throw it on without having. Do we anticipate? I mean, I know it's a month out, but yeah. are there major things that we anticipate may come before us in April that we should look at an agenda session in the end of March? In April, um, we normally bring to you the various. Um, proclamations and resolutions that you adopt in May. So um, we have to look at how that will fall now. It may not be necessary to, um, well, one of them, two of them are the first and second week in May. So uh, you would need to adopt that in April. But those are things you've seen in the past. Yes, so it would right. be a- They're the standard proclamations and resolutions that, that you normally adopt. We are taking a rezoning request, not this one, just a straight general use rezoning request to the planning board tomorrow that would come to you in April. Um, I know that this isn't in the paperwork, but would the board consider the fourth Monday starting on March 28th so that we have an agenda session leading into April? I know that it's kind of short notice and that I, fix, I might want to look fix at what your worry is. Is that what you're that would that would be the workshop before the regular meeting? Yeah. Mm -hmm. have three As meetings. opposed to the first so we would month. have three meetings in the month of March. Yeah. No, I, I have no opposition to that. Does there neither do I? No, don't either. That's kind of how I thought things were going to happen when we were first doing it. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the fourth Monday would be March a work 20th. session meeting. Okay. Yeah. So we meet on March 15th. So is, is there any situation where the Tuesday this year, second Tuesday, conflicts with uh, the. Like I checked, there's no conflict. Perfect. Oh my gracious. <laughs> I, I did not believe it. it. Yeah. Okay. Um, the thoughts on that, are we okay with adding Monday, March 28th as the first agenda slash work session as part of the new meeting schedule? We have enough time for that, right? If we vote next week. Oh, yes. I have no concern. Um, is that something that we want to consider on the consent agenda or would we like to just vote on that? Next week. Or you just add it to your schedule. Huh? You just put it in the schedule. Oh, we don't have to vote? Well, we're making it part of your schedule oh. that you're going to vote on next week. Okay. But I'm saying oh, the whole thing to the consent agenda. Oh. The whole. With the, the addition schedule, of March. The schedule would be on the consent agenda. Yeah. So we, with yeah. the addition of March 28th. Exactly. The only change I guess we're going to make is we're going to add that March 28th meeting mm -hmm. instead of calling the Tuesday. Call the regular meeting. We'll continue to call that our regular meeting. Exactly. Exactly. I agree. We don't need to make a motion to do that, do we? 
No, we'll have the we'll have it worked up for you for. All right, so we'll put that on the consent agenda. Okay, next item of new business: consideration of charter amendment changing board of aldermen to town council. This is me. If you want to be. So <laughs> at our um, board retreat, one of the things that I had brought up, I didn't realize we were going to talk about it so soon until I saw the agenda. So here we are, um, is the fact that when. I didn't see it on the agenda. That's why oh, it's it wasn't until letter. today. Yeah. Oh. Okay. I'm looking at um, software. Is the fact that. No matter, it seems like no matter where you go, even here in town, when you say you are on the board of aldermen or you are an alderman or alderwoman, I mean, the the comment that I get back most is, what's an older woman? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, no one really understands what a board of aldermen is. And so my go-to is always, it's town council. Oh, yes, town council. Yes, I get it. So... Um, and this has actually been brought up to me on several occasions by individuals about why don't we just change it to town council. So I thought it would be good for us to have that discussion. And of course, we would want to have that discussion out in the open. So here we are. So let's open the floor. I have one comment question right away. Um, it just kind of happened tonight when we were reading all the new language. It says Board of Aldermen. So if we just change, that means we then have to then go back and change all of our codes and everything. Can we do a blanket change? Can we do a blanket change like that? If we make that change, can we make a, a blanket change to all of our stuff that mentions Board of Aldermen anywhere? Is yeah. that something that can be done, Joe? Yeah. I think so. Mm -hmm. Just, I mean, the, the initial step would we would probably do it. Any place that says Board of Aldermen, it means Town Council. Any place that says, uh, you know, Board, it means or uh, older person or older man, it means Counselor, and and then just change it that way. So is this like it, it's first a charter amendment under 168 101 or whatever. Yeah, yeah it's it is, anyway. you know, and then it's an ordinance amendment just to go right. to find and replace. Yeah. Yeah. And what I put in your packet is a resolution of intent. You have to you have to adopt that first or approve that first. And then after after that, then um, you have a ordinance change, which is a public hearing. Charter change. And you'd also have to then go change the ordinances to get the wording right. Exactly. exactly. So does this have to be approved by the legislature before we vote? No, it does not. So we would do the resolution of intent, mm -hmm. then hold a public hearing, following, and then vote on it, and then it goes to the legislature. If the legislature approves it, then we go and change the ordinances. That's what I did today. Does it have to go to the yeah, okay. I'm surprised that the town's name could be changed as easily as it was way yeah. back. Yeah. Um, but it does have to go to the legislature. The charter does. The charter does. Yes. Yeah, they're, 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 and I just glanced at it yeah. when I saw that it was yeah. on the they agenda. They have relaxed it to some degree. Yeah, they relaxed it to make easy ones and hard ones. Exactly. Hard -wise. exactly. It's, it's, it's easy one. 1311 didn't have to go through the legislature, which is what's in your packet. You'll you'll see it if uh, you didn't have a chance to read it, which is in 160A101. And then they have items one through 11. And the reason it's on your agenda tonight, as opposed to last week, <laughs> um, was we had gotten notice from, um, I guess the league that now is the time to be contacting our legislators about local legislation. So if we had waited till April to start this, we're holding hearings in May, and you know we're we're getting behind the getting behind the ball on getting uh, legislation submitted and considered. So once, assuming you approve the resolution next week. We'll go ahead and we'll start making those contacts through the league and through our legislators that hey, we are pursuing this. Here's our schedule. We'd like you to start the process at the legislative level so that we can get the charter changed. 
mm -hmm. and, you know, not lose a year or two. So one thing to consider is for everybody sitting up here, are your signs? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> they're going to be sitting there having to cross it all off. <laughs> yeah, you know, you could always just use a sharpie. Um, but Do you remember me sharpies? <laughs> I do. Yeah, yeah, sharp sharp sharpies, as a matter of fact. I guess I have one question. Obviously, um, there may be some confusion, but I guess is that a, a very important thing that we need to be concerned about that people don't know the difference between an alderman? councilman or commissioner um, i think so in the sense it could make us more effective i think it might make Change us our feel more not us personally yeah. but i mean just like you said uh you'll go around walking around town or you'll mm -hmm. talk to uh uh members of the community if they ask who you are and you're like i'm town count like i'm monty allison i'm on the city council it might they're like oh I'm talking to somebody opposed to the first thing. So they might have a grievance they want to give to us right then, opposed to what's an alderman, right? Like that's always the first question. So I think in that regard, it could, but I understand what you're saying. Um, but I think if we, if our titles are city council, um, it may uh, help the public feel like they can come to us or when we're out and about um, more so than the first question from us is alderman. Explain that to me. What, what is alderman? Oh, so you do it the same thing a city council member does? Yeah. I look at it as an opportunity to have a longer conversation with them. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't worry about when a cop pulls behind you either. So. I <laughs> and I, I had another discovery today too. So I wanted want you all to think about this. Some people will write the word councilman instead of council member. So you're going to be back where you were if you say councilman instead of council member. Counselor, yeah. Council person? Counselor. Counselor. Mm -hmm. Is that a thing? Well, the councils, yes. But this doesn't require a lot of work from us, right? We just would say, yes, let's do this, and then boop. Well, boop. it doesn't require a lot of work, but what are the dominoes? Because obviously all, this, all the documentation that we've got has got to be updated, right, Pam? Then you've got it shows the word alderman has to be ordinances. And it's not like a word search where you go and replace all it happens. So I guess my concern is let's find out what all what all the impact is going to be. What's it going to do to our staff if they have to go do this? It would be a word search for the code of ordinances because it's yeah. you know, the way it's codified. That would that would be easy enough. Many code this at for us. Yeah. I mean, and they call the our code of ordinances, so they would do that step for us. There, there is a cost involved. Yeah, That's, yeah, they don't do it for nothing. Right. Um, you, you can also, you know, anytime we touch the code, it's fix the, the areas that we're touching. And gradually, you know, if you put in the put in the the descriptor at the beginning of our town code, like I said earlier, where it says. Board of Aldermen, it means Towns Council. Where it says board, it means council. Where it says alder person, alder man, it means counselor. That can be, at, that's, that's a relatively simple change that conveys the message. Then anytime the ordinances are being touched, you fix each one as you go. So it, you can do it either way. You can do a blanket, muni code, charge us what it's gonna be, or we'll fix it as we move along until some point, you know, the number shrinks. Um, and that, that is, that's probably a more fiscally responsible way of doing it, but you can do it either way. I mean, I hear the same things that our mayor and when brought up it's the same thing every time I go out it's what what are you and then from a certain population and I'm just going to say it and be candid they say that's very sexist and so um you know it's the same as if we were calling everybody an older woman I mean we just wouldn't do that so you know there, there is a percentage of the population that does see it that way and I I haven't brought it up they say it to me I don't know if they say it to our mayor as well I don't want to put you on the spot <laughs> that's my saying for the day but um <laughs> I'll just get a button that says that um but that is something that has brought up to me when I when I when I have said that I mean I think 
you know, it's antiquated as well. You know, it, the, the etymology of it is literally meaning elder man. So, you know, I think if we're going to also look at it from that standpoint in that originally elder men were the only people who were allowed to run for office or vote for people who run for office, I think that changing to council provides us with a little more modern. And I'm not saying we have to vote on it now, but I think it's something that we I think it's an opportunity to discuss it. For sure. I don't have a problem as long as it's not going to cost us a lot of money. I think that's my main concern there. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I agree with what y'all said. Well, I'll tell people, well, I'm on the board of all. What is that? Yeah. Um, nobody well, knows what it is. Yeah. And to Monty and Quinn's points, you know, if somebody doesn't know what a board of aldermen is, they're not going to know what type of questions to ask you, or they might just, they may not ask you what a board of aldermen is, and they might just move on versus if they knew that you were on, you know, town council, they're going to bring that up. Everyone knows what the mayor is, right? I haven't had to explain my title for four months. It's so <laughs> lovely. I mean, you know, but um, for four years, you know, it was, it was also always, what do I call myself? Do I say older woman? Do I, and I would always default to, I'm a member of the board of aldermen um, and still nobody knew what that was. So again, we don't have to maybe. I think it's, I think it's good to talk about it. I mean, I, I think um, to Mark's point, what is it gonna cost? Can we find that out? Well, he gave us two routes. So if we go the other, there's, there's a cheaper route you're saying. There's a, a more fiscally responsible route. I think you said it would be a disclaimer, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and a couple lines of text is, you know, I, they, they charge you by by the letter usually, or or you know how many times they need to access it. So if you just put in a disclaimer at the beginning, it's a minimal cost. Um, if you're changing the entire town code. And they've got to go through that process of searching and replacing or touching all these different pages. So, you know, one, one avenue would be to put in the disclaimer, we're touching one page only. And as we touch all the other pages, we, we fix it as we go. And that would be a minimal, a minimal charge well, if we're, we're already touching as we're going, because we're already working on that particular yeah. document. Yeah. Okay. Can we do some research to see what the cost differences might be? Sure. We'll, we'll, we, we can, <coughs> they can give us an estimate of you know, how many pages are, they're going to need to list us for. Mm -hmm. That would be the, the, the trick. I mean, I can download it and then just do a search for- yeah, Absolutely. It'll pull it. up every instance where that word occurs, and then we'll know how many times yeah. that they're going to need to touch it. But I mean, are they just going to like enter, 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 enter to make the replace or are they, are they going to charge us to type in something new? I mean, this can't be a lot of money. Honestly, it's really simple. For them. Like, I mean, there's okay. no way. Let's just, I will, I will get the cost. I will get a quote. We can check. Okay. Anything else before we move on? Well. Mayor Tully would be late for his dinner is all I have to say. Um, reports, town manager. Um, I'll be very brief tonight. We received a letter of resignation from our assistant town manager, planning director, Pam DeSoto, this past week. And she will be departing us on March 25th will be her last day. I thought we were voting on that. <laughs> oh, you can certainly vote on it if you like. All opposed. It hurts. <laughs> it hurts. So uh, uh, a sad day, certainly, and um, you know we're gonna certainly gonna miss her. What did you say the last day was? March twenty fifth. It's before March twenty eighth meeting. Mm -hmm. And will we have something here for Pam? Yes. 
That's it. Is okay. that brief? One, one, way, one way ticket to he, to Haiti would be. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Did you say a halfway ticket? No, we'll talk to the budget committee about that. <laughs> we'll leave it on them. All right, let's start with Quinn tonight. So how this works. Um, you all complain if you go last, you complain if you go first. Uh, no, it's just nice seeing uh, the daffodils blooming, right? Uh, and Joe walking around town and the, the kids picking them. Um, but but nothing really, you know, I just thank all you guys. Pam, uh, I'm going to miss you. I have yet to uh, engage in this conversation with you, but I plan on soon. I'm just <laughs> refraining myself right now. Uh, and thanks to the police. Uh, hopefully uh, I went through a traffic check this past the other night. Um, hopefully everything was cool. Did you get nervous? Yeah, because I didn't have my license. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I get it. <laughs> But everything's computer now, so I could just tell them what's up and you know, everything was every, everything was good. But yeah, of course I did. And I was like, man, at one point I was like, I'm going to turn around. It's like, nope, as soon as I turn around, I know what that's going to cause. Um, and I had a crying kid, so it, everything went what's good. Is that me? I'm good. Just we're going to miss Pam a lot. Thank you for all your hard work. Thank you. Randy? It was a shock today. That's all I can have to say. Thank you for all you do. And I got a chance to spend some time with you prior to election too. And you were so helpful and, and uh, it's a tough loss. And just want you to know that. Thank you. And we haven't had any committee meetings that I can report on since we met. So uh, that's it for me too. Thank you. Monty? Yeah, I, I second what Ms. Sherry, we're gonna, Pam's your, your valuable asset. And we're going to miss you. And uh, um, I wish you the best. I really do. Um, and um, I appreciate the survey that we, we heard tonight from our police department. I think it kind of confirmed what we kind of felt like that um, we ain't so bad. Um, and I think we have a staff that cares about our community and um, is it perfect? No. There's always opportunities. So <clears throat> you need to work. Mark. Same here, Pam. I'll miss you. Really? Sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, tough, tough uh, news to get, but hey, you've got to do what's best for you, and we understand that completely. And uh, we did have our first budget committee meeting uh, this afternoon, and a lot to go over. And thank you guys for putting everything together. I thought we got a lot accomplished in a short period of time. So. Yes, and I can't take any credit for that. that was all, all he's our finance director now. So <laughs> all him. Well, well, and, and he's about to be the planning director. <laughs> Needs a raise. You know, he could be the fire chief, <laughs> finance director, town manager, planner, <laughs> deputy clerk. <laughs> I mean, oh, wow. Okay. I've always wanted big shoulders, you know. <laughs> There you go. And I want to thank the budget committee. I know that you all have started that process and it's an important one. And I do not envy you with the decisions that you have to make and bring um, before us. So thank you for your time and effort on that. Um, this past weekend, I really enjoyed seeing so many parents in town. Um, it was nice to, you know, just have more people in town and the weather was great. So everything was lively. I attended the softball game and Lila Kate got some uh, autographs. So she was really excited about that. Um, I know that I reported this at the um, retreat, but I did have the opportunity to attend the mayor's association and it was a wonderful experience to connect with other small town mayors from around the state. And I would really encourage anyone who can to try to attend City Vision, which is the league's um, event in April. Um, unfortunately, I cannot attend. I'll be at a work event out of town, but um, just judging by what I experienced at the Mayor's Association, I can only imagine that City Vision is going to be an excellent event. Randy, did you want to put in a plug for the quilt show this next week? Well, it has started. and. Uh... And it will it be to open to the public Wednesday, Thursday, Friday from 10 to 4, and Saturday, I believe, I don't have the exact hours, but I believe it's 10 to 1 or 10 to 2. 
and, uh, and we're hoping that we have a good good first year here in Elon. Good event. All right. Well, Mark, I think you've got a motion yeah. for us. I'd like to make a motion for this board to enter into a closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143.318-318.11A3 so that this board may consult with the town attorney and preserve attorney-client privilege. Your second? I'll second that. Okay, aye. 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 Well, we want to thank everyone for joining. Um, you're welcome to stay and return following a closed session, but no additional business will be done following um, our closed session. We'll give it two minutes here and then we'll get started.